Hello and welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at a case of In the Matter of an Application by Geraldine Finucane for Judicial Review, and the citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 7. This week our episode takes us back to the troubles in Northern Ireland and, more specifically, the murder in 1989 of Pat Finucane. Finucane was a solicitor and through his skilled legal work proved to be very much a thorn in the side of the British establishment throughout the 1980s as he worked on a number of human rights cases such as that of hunger striker Bobby Sands and the men who died during the 1981 Mays Prison protest. Arguably his most famous case, and the one that directly contributed to him becoming a target, was the successful defence of Pat McGowan in the wake of the so-called Corporals killings, where two British Army Corporals were murdered by the IRA. McGowan had been charged with organising the attack, but early on in the trial, Finucan had demonstrated that there was not enough evidence against his client, and so the charges were dropped. One of his other clients later reported that police had told him Finucane's just the same as you, we'll have to take him out. Only months after the charges against McGowan were dropped, Finucane was shot 14 times in front of his wife and three children as they were sitting down to dinner. The loyalist terrorists who were responsible for the killing were the Ulster Defence Association, but it soon became apparent that there was collusion between the murderers and members of the British state security forces. When those who represent the United Kingdom are implicated in a cold-blooded murder, this warrants serious attention, but the investigations proved to have limited effect. An inquiry into collusion from 1999 identified William Stobie as providing the murder weapon, but his trial collapsed. Meanwhile, Brian Nelson from the Army's Force Research Unit provided intelligence regarding Finucane's whereabouts, and had been involved in the gathering of intelligence about potential assassination targets. A short time later, pressure from Amnesty International for a new public inquiry led to an investigation by Canadian Judge Peter Corrie, but the only result was the judge's own recommendation for a full public inquiry. Meanwhile, Geraldine Finucane, who is the person at the heart of this judicial review, and the widow of Pat Finucane, brought a case again before the European Court of Human Rights and successfully got a judgement in 2003 that there had not been an inquiry into her husband's death that complied with Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which is an issue we will come back to later. Pressure mounted once again in 2006 when the US House of Representatives passed a resolution calling for Britain to hold a public inquiry. Such an inquiry was actually announced in 2007, but was stymied by provisions of the Inquiries Act 2005, which allowed the government to block scrutiny of actions taken by the state. With the prospect of a whitewash, the Finucane family refused to cooperate, and the inquiry received widespread criticism for its lack of penetration due to the 2005 Act. Following the 2010 general election, a new coalition government was formed under David Cameron, and there was renewed hope for justice to be served, but this was short-lived as, although the family would receive an official apology, it was announced in 2011 that there would not be a public inquiry, and that instead an independent review would be undertaken by Sir Desmond de Silva. While there was unrestricted access to documents, and de Silva was allowed to meet with people to help with his inquiries, he was not allowed to conduct oral hearings. Serious questions were raised when access to one of Brian Nelson's former handlers was prevented on medical grounds, without any actual medical evidence provided by the Ministry of Defence. Overall, the report was more of the same for the Finucane family with no real answers, and so Geraldine Finucane brought this case in judicial review on the basis that she had a legitimate expectation for a public inquiry to be held that had been consistently frustrated. Furthermore, human rights arguments were presented based on the right to life under Article 2 and Section 6 of the Human Rights Act 1998, which requires public authorities to act in a way which is not in contravention of the rights under the Convention. The lower courts made limited steps that favoured Mrs Finucane's position, but it would ultimately be up to the Supreme Court to have the final word, and so that is where we pick things up. The justices began with the legitimate expectation of Mrs Finucane, which, in order to be enforceable, 
has to come from a public authority, and be clear and unambiguous. In this case, the various promises and undertakings made by a number of ministers were held to be sufficient to amount to a legitimate expectation that a public inquiry into the murder of Pat Finucane would take place. One of the questions raised by the government was whether this principle still applied when that promise was made to only a select group of individuals, like the Finucane family, rather than the public at large, but the court dismissed the premise of this argument almost out of hand as the undertaking was a matter of public policy, and there would be a general public interest in the outcome of such an inquiry. Nevertheless, that does not mean that there is an inherent right to an inquiry, and there are circumstances in which the government may be within its legal rights to go back on such a promise. Ultimately, the decision to hold an inquiry is a political one, and the government may decide that there are credible policy reasons for departing from this undertaking. The justice is held that where this is the case, and the decision is made in good faith, it will be very difficult for an individual to enforce compliance through the courts. Further to this, the allegations by Mrs Finucane that there is some massive cover-up are clearly very serious and go to the heart of the state's actions in relation to Northern Ireland. For this to be accepted by the court, there would have to be very clear evidence presented, and that simply does not exist here. From this point, the court moved on to address the human rights issues, and in particular those arising under Article 2, the right to life. At first glance, it might seem unusual to bring a case under this part of the convention as Pat Finucane is dead and so any right to life that he may have had is now unfortunately extinguished. However, the right goes much further than this and also encompasses a duty to investigate suspicious deaths as established in a long line of jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights with cases such as Jordan and UK from 2001. Such an investigation must be effective, and the lead judgement by Lord Kerr takes some time to explore what exactly this means. An effective investigation may lead to a prosecution, but that by itself is not necessarily enough. Instead, it has to be able to lead to the identification and punishment of those involved in the death in question. For the court, the De Silva Review did not accomplish this, and looking at their description, it seems like it didn't even really come close. To start off with, there was no means of compelling witnesses to provide testimony, and the evidence that was provided by those who did voluntarily attend was not subject to any sort of cross-examination or verification. This is all before we get to the key witness, who was excused on medical grounds without any medical evidence to support this position. Putting it more simply, the De Silva Review did not meet the requirements under Article 2 of the Convention, and therefore the UK still remains in contravention. Before we move on and try to analyse this case, it is worth mentioning one final argument that was put forward by the government in its defence, namely that Pat Finucane died in 1989, more than 11 years before the Human Rights Act 1998 came into force in the UK. The question for the court was whether this means that there is actually no enforceable obligation to investigate. For the justices, this simply did not stand up to scrutiny. For a start, the death itself and the duty to investigate are separate things that, for the purposes of the law, can be detached. Of course, these events are related, but the idea that if someone died the day before the Human Rights Act came into force, and a day later it was decided that there would be no investigation, simply doesn't hold any water. The time difference here is more than a day, and that is a relevant factor, but does not necessarily extinguish the obligation that the state has. Other important factors, such as the dates on which various undertakings were given by government ministers to the Finucane family, as well as new evidence that has been uncovered over the years, all point to an ongoing subject that still remains very much in the public interest. So how do we approach such a case as this? In some ways it is actually quite difficult, because the UK government is clearly in the wrong, and so it is not surprising that this was noted in such a clear fashion when the question finally went before the independent judicial branch, instead of some flimsy review or investigation that relies on government patronage for its existence. The truth is that the entire process since 1989 has been somewhat suspect, and based only on what we have heard in this case alone, it is not hard to discern a real desire on the part of the British state to keep the truth hidden. Indeed, the Daily Telegraph once indirectly quoted David Cameron as saying, Quote, 
There are people in buildings all around here who won't let a full investigation happen. End quote. All of this raises questions about just how serious this country is about the peace process in Northern Ireland as a whole. The Good Friday Agreement was an important step for the six counties, but there is a consummate failure to understand that this was not just the end of a conflict, but also the start of peace, and that maintaining this peace does itself require hard work from all sides. This is something that has very much been missing from the UK side for a number of years now, as the troubles are left in the past and the accord is taken for granted. We see this through a failure by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to broker a deal and restore devolved government to Belfast, instead tacitly falling back into de facto home rule. We see this through the Brexit negotiations where Northern Ireland is treated more like a hindrance to a deal instead of a fundamental part of the UK. We see this through other failed inquiries in respect of other tragedies on both sides of the conflict so that past wounds are allowed to fester instead of being exposed and allowed to heal. Indeed, you may have seen in the previous week that there have been a number of news stories about the words and actions of the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, and also how these reviews are potentially going to be carried out, and even if they are actually going to be carried out. This case was originally about collusion between the state and a terrorist organisation that was used to commit murder. It is now much deeper and is about collusion within the corridors of power to prevent the truth ever coming to light. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. A couple of shout outs for iTunes reviews that were very kindly left for the podcast. I think we're up to sort of an average rating of five stars now, which is amazing. Um, firstly to Dave R226, who left a very nice review and a particular thanks to Seb Seb M who uh, is a writer and has actually written law books on EU financial regulatory law um, and gave a five-star review himself. So thank you very much to both of you uh, for those reviews. And remember, you can also leave reviews on iTunes as well. It's very much appreciated. I'll be back with another case next week. For now, bye.